Let's just start by asking a quick question. Does revealed scripture testify to the geographical location of the Book of Mormon? Where in the world did the Book of Mormon actually occur? That's the question that we're going to be addressing uh, throughout this uh, information. Where is the Book of Mormon's promised land? You see, if we can identify where the promised land is, that'll help us to understand where we might be looking for evidences for the Book of Mormon. And we know that the Book of Mormon did, in fact, occur on the Promised Land because when Lehi arrived, they, when they arrived on the boat, he said, we have obtained the Promised Land. And throughout the Book of Mormon, uh, they claim to have been consistently on this Promised Land. So we're going to talk about information on the prophecies and the promises about the Promised Land in the latter days. And it turns out that there's actually 36 specific prophecies and promises um, that identify, I feel quite clearly, where and what the promised land is according to the scriptures. And in fact, let's talk about that for just a second. The importance of scriptures can't be overstated. You have to start from a foundation of truth. In the gospel, we know that we have to start from a firm foundation. And that is what we want to try to do in doing any research on regard to the geography of the Book of Mormon. According to Joseph Fielding Smith in Doctrines of Salvation, he states this, it makes no difference what is written or what anyone has said if what has been said is in conflict with what the Lord has revealed. We can set it aside. My words and the teachings of any other member of the church, high or low, if they do not square with the revelations, we need not accept them. Let us have this matter clear. Harold B. Lee, in Stand Ye in Holy Places, said this, If there is any teacher who teaches a doctrine that can't be substantiated from the standard works, and I make one qualification, and that is, unless that one be the president of the church, who alone has the right to declare new doctrine, then you may know by that same token that such a teacher is but expressing his own opinion. I don't care what his position is, if he writes something or speaks something that goes beyond anything you can find in the standard works, and unless that one be the prophet, seer, and revelator, and please note that one exception, you may immediately say, well, that is his own idea. So we have to start from the scriptures. In fact, uh, Bruce Porter, when he was doing research for the church, um, actually was told to use only three things as primary research. He said, number one, you have to use the scriptures. Number two, Joseph Smith's written and revelatory statements. Number three, they could use the words of a prophet while he was the prophet. Now, I have uh, made the scriptures in green because throughout this presentation, when you see green words, those are scriptures. And so you can know immediately that's a scriptural reference that we're using. This research hierarchy is very important because this can be used as primary evidence but then there's, a lot of times there's other things that can be used as supporting evidence, but unless it comes from one of these three primary sources, this is the best way of having a foundation that you can start with and rely on. What has been proposed for conducting research involving the geography of the Book of Mormon is actually um, was outlined and established by Dr. John L. Sorensen of BYU. In his book, Mormon's Map, he states this, what logically would be one of the first steps in a systematic investigation to construct a map of the American land of promise based solely on statements in that scripture, which has at least 550 different passages that are relevant to this, seems not to have occurred to anyone during the church's first century. The current method is this is the first step then in conducting this kind of research is to extract from the Book of Mormon those passages involving geographical references and create or develop an internal or hypothetical map. So what we're, what we're supposed to do is take these 550 passages and actually create a mental map and then try to apply that someplace on a real world setting. One of the ways that this has all begun is one of the questions that's always asked is where in the Americas is there a narrow neck of land? Now this is from the Book of Mormon in Alma chapter 63 verse 5. They were on the borders of the land bountiful by the land desolation. They launched into the West Sea by the narrow neck which led into the land northward. So we know that there was a narrow neck of land that was involved with the Book of Mormon. And what has happened is, is that that one geographical feature that's mentioned in the Book of Mormon has become the primary feature 
the primary geographical feature of the Book of Mormon lands. John L. Sorensen, in his book, Ancient American Setting for the Book of Mormon, on page six, also gives us an example of how the Book of Mormon geographic research has been previously conducted. There is this hourglass shape of the lands of the Book of Mormon based on these scriptures about the narrow neck. This is from uh, John Sorensen in Mormon's Map. He says, at least 80 versions of a Book of Mormon map has now been produced. This is back in 2000. Ideas have ranged from identifying the promised land as the entire hemisphere to limiting the scene to a small portion of, say, Costa Rica or New York. There have been now even more uh, that have been proposed that actually range from Indonesia to all of the uh, Western Hemisphere to a little location that's actually only about 70 miles by 90 miles right next to the Hill Cumorah in Western New York. According to Dr. Sorensen, he says the result has been tremendous confusion and a plethora of notions that holds no promise of producing a consensus. Now there has been some amount of consensus that has been reached and that many scholars have determined that Central America or Mesoamerica is the location for that we should be looking for the evidences of the Book of Mormon. Actually, more recent estimations have now placed this number of maps that have been produced, these hypothetical maps, at over 150 different geographies for the Book of Mormon. But then ask the question, how well is this method working? This shows that when it comes down to Book of Mormon geography, we have geographies literally all over the map. <laughs> Why would we have that if the Book of Mormon has sufficient geographic information to positively produce a cohesive internal map? Why would there exist so many different geographies? George Q. Cannon gives us an answer. Simply because the Book of Mormon is not a geographical primer. It was not written to teach geographical truths and nowhere gives us the exact situation or boundaries so that it can be definitely located without fear of error. There's just not enough information in the Book of Mormon text itself, even with the 550 passages, to be able to make, without question, a map that, that will fit on a real-world real map. If the current method is not working, is a new method needed? If we were going to propose a new method, what would it be? Well, we do know this. We know we need to start from a firm foundation of the Scriptures. So how should we begin our search for a new method of conducting research on the geography of the Book of Mormon? But this time, rather than using the passages that are geographic in nature, maybe we should utilize these scriptures for the purpose with which they were actually preserved. What was that purpose? For what purpose was the Book of Mormon record preserved? For the geographical information? the physical aspects of it, or the prophecies and promises, the spiritual aspects of the Book of Mormon. Well, of course, uh, this will help us to uh, clarify that, and we'll use the scriptures from the, from, and the Book of Mormon itself. In Mormon chapter 5, verses 12 and 14, it says this, Now these things are written unto the remnant of the house of Jacob, and they are hid up unto the Lord, that they may come forth in his own due time, they shall go unto the unbelieving of the Jews, and for this intent or purpose shall they go, that they may be persuaded that Jesus is the Christ. That's the first reason why the Book of Mormon record was preserved, to testify of Jesus Christ. Then it goes on, it says, that the, the Son of the living God, that the Father may bring about through his most beloved his great and eternal purpose in restoring the Jews, or all the house of Israel, to the land of their inheritance which the Lord their God hath given them unto the fulfilling of his covenant. Doctrine and Covenant section 3, verses 18 to 20 says this, And this testimony shall come to the knowledge of the Lamanites, and the Lemuelites, and the Ishmaelites. And for this very purpose are these plates preserved, which contain these records, that the promises of the Lord might be fulfilled, which he made to his people, and that the Lamanites might come to the knowledge of their fathers and that they might know the promises of the Lord, and that they may believe the gospel and rely upon the merits of Jesus Christ. 